start by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about you. Hi, my name is Kylar Broadus, and I grew up in Missouri, and I always consider myself a Missourian from a small town called Fayette, Missouri, uh, where I'm very proud to be from. Uh, my family uh, mostly isn't there because they're deceased, but I grew up with uh, two wonderful parents, and uh, my mother and father and my sister. Um, and they were uh, very supportive people, and uh, for the most part, my childhood, I had some roughness because I grew up when America was very black and white, and as you can see, I'm a very light-skinned black person, so that, that was difficult um, because I faced uh, bullying every single day since I can remember. Um, so I learned how to deal with bullying very early on, and then also I was gender non-conforming, so that added to, uh, I'm sure, the bullying, uh, but uh, the one good thing I had, I think, was a solid home base that helped me to survive, so a little bit about me. Um, I am a lawyer, um, have been a professor. I was a, left as a tenured professor, taught at a historically black college, and um, I think that's probably enough for now. So we'll see where the questions lead us. Sounds good. Which people have inspired you? Um, for me, it's always my parents. Um, they, uh, you know, we always say slavery was abolished in 1859 when Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but in reality, that really isn't true and wasn't true. And, you know, I watched my parents as they lived their lives and they hit a lot of things that they had endured. And so did my one living grandmother uh, from us, but I saw how they had to live and how many jobs they had to work. And that's why I have had a job since I was five years old, because each of them had night jobs and my sister and I would go with them at, to their night jobs as well as their day jobs. And uh, so we we were all we knew how to work, and that's why we we're workers. And um, they always taught us uh, the importance of the value of work, and that nobody was ever going to give us anything, and that it was going to be difficult to be black in America, and there are th certain things that you had to navigate. And um, sadly, as we see in the recent election. That is so true. Uh, they always taught me that I was going to be treated as an other uh, just due to my race, uh, but to never uh, be ashamed of my race, to always be a proud person, and to always be a strong person. So I, I and I, you know, I could only imagine the things they had been through, some things they shared, uh, some things they didn't. Uh, so, uh, I figured if they could endure and live through the things that they did and my grandparents did and the ancestors before them, that I could certainly live through, uh, the things that I've had to live through. So they've always inspired me. They're always with me. And anytime I talk, um, I always talk about them. Anytime, uh, I'm going through a rough patch, I always think about them. Uh, and the things they had to endure. So that gives me fuel and energy, and, and those are the people that inspire me and are my heroes, my mother and my father. That's wonderful. Well, what do you hope to inspire in others? Uh, my my uh, hope is that, has always been, uh, since I had such good role models, to be a good role model for other people. Um, and... Uh, that is how I've always held myself to be uh, and continue to be. I don't think that will change, especially at my age now. I don't think I'm old, but I definitely am middle-aged. And that was just drilled into me to be a good model citizen. Uh, don't put up with crap, of course. Don't be abused or treated badly by anybody, including the system, so to speak. Uh, because, you know, I grew up in a time where people think it was so long ago, but it was still separate but equal things happening. When I grew up, I remember a white water fountain and a Negro water fountain and bathrooms. 
And um, so uh, I want everybody to be treated equal. I want everybody to be respected. And I try to live my life that way. And I try to role model that. And I try to fight for those rights. And then I don't want anybody to live through the things that I've lived through as a trans person, as a black person uh, on this earth. And so I continue to fight for the rights of all people um, and work with all people. And I want people to realize that we have more similarities than we do differences, but it's hard for us to get that. Um, and I think that's a really sad thing as we see the divisiveness in this country right now and really in our own communities uh, because we really do. And I see that all the time because I'm mistaken for so many different cultures. It, it may, it's laughable depending on where I am and what I'm doing. And, uh, and then uh, but then I bond with people and it shows me just how much similarity we have and so if we could get over our stuff and work on our own issues individually and come together as a united people and I'd start to see that we are because of course we face adversity now but if we could do that on a regular basis I think the world would be a much better place so true so true yeah who is one black trans person you think everyone should know about other than you <sighs> Oh, that's hard to say because um, they've passed. Uh, you know, one I think is Alexander Goodrum, uh, who has passed. Uh, Marcel Daniels is another person who has passed and gone on. Um, there there are, are, are several living, Yesenio Lewis, and of course these all sound transmasculine. Uh, but we hear so much about people that are not transmasculine in this day that I think I have to uplift the voice of transmasculine people that have done so much to pave the way, that no traction, that get no recognition, that get no credibility. So I name those three people because they have done so much for this movement uh, and get no recognition and no respect and no acknowledgement that uh, I would say those would be three people uh, of color that I would uh, say that uh, I respect greatly and have done lots and people don't even know about. Can you tell us a little bit more about each of the, the three individuals who you just told us about? Well, they protested, they thought uh, and I fought alongside them. They carved, Alexander was great about carving out policies for us uh, in Arizona uh, and leading the way in doing that. Um, and um, uh, Marcel is a, a leader in the trans community as well. And um, they were just all champions. Uh, and um, it was their life that they committed to this movement, like so many of us in that day and time. And I actually just read a post um, from one of my friends that's uh, not of color, but uh, and it made so much sense. It's like, was it really worth it being broke? It was, we were broke. We couldn't get jobs, but yet we sacrificed any money we had to do this work because we had to pay to get into things to do trans work. We had to fight to get in the door, every door. Uh, there were no doors open to us, and um, they were they were just champions. And and uh, my friend's post was, you know, some days it just doesn't feel worth it because we're considered nobodies. And, and I even feel that way today, uh, sadly. And, um, it, but it does seem worth it when you see the little Boy Scout getting Boy Scouts or the little Girl Scout getting Girl Scouts. And it brings tears to your eyes because then it, it feels like, yes, it was really worth it. Because otherwise we take a lot of crap and stuff and hatred from our own community, which really amazes me how we beat each other up in our own community and we don't even know the work that many of these people did, particularly people that are over a certain age. 
And this is the first generation where we actually see our elders. And nobody is willing to acknowledge that. Um, when we looked for elders, we wanted to see elders. And we had none, but yet we bonded together no matter what race we were, no matter what iteration of trans we were. And we were fighting for trans rights for all people. And we came together uh, in what we would call the second wave of activism to fight for all people. There wasn't this divisiveness that I see now in the community. And I'm glad to be able to have this interview and not be attacked and say that. But there is such divisiveness in the community that I just don't see any community. Uh, it's all about uh, individuality and me, 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 rather than a community that's about trans people. And we, we included gender nonconforming people then. That's not new. There are many of us, including myself, that have lived gender nonconforming. Uh, but people just see you one way and they make such assumptions. And it's sad because trans history isn't written down, so nobody knows, nobody reads, and um, so there's a lot of hate thrown to people that paved the way for this generation to be able to do what it does to get jobs. And uh, I see and hear so much hurt from uh, elders that have lived because it's not only trans women that don't live long, trans masculine people don't live long. I mean, the th two of the three people I named aren't living, and one is in good health. And, uh, you know, we die young too, um, you know, and we get raped too, we do sex work too, we do all those things, but it's, we're not allowed to speak, we're not allowed to talk about those things. And it's funny because we come from the other side where we weren't allowed to talk about it before, and now we transition and we're not allowed to talk about it still. And I think it's just appalling how stifling it is when people just want to be themselves. And that's what I've been fighting for. And at this point, I see that we're still stuck in this box. Yeah. My goodness. And I'm so grateful to your generation, too, because I, I, I'm very aware that y'all make it possible for us to exist. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you, my friend. And, and, and I know there are some folks out there, but the, the greater voice, you know, shouts us down and talks us down and really doesn't respect trans people that are masculine of center uh, as if we have some sort of privilege, which we don't. Uh, you know, I've worked five jobs until I was 50. People assumed I have some sort of magical money or privilege, which I don't. And um, it's just like, no, doesn't happen. Uh, we're all trans, and when they're going to kill people, they're going to kill us all. They're not going to distinguish between who it is. And when they rape us, they don't distinguish between who it is. Once they find out we're trans, they just rape us all. And I've represented many trans people for free, and that's what happens in jails. And um, But yet... Yeah, we, we don't have that discourse because the work that started didn't get finished for trans people. We stopped at a certain point because of other issues and funding and et cetera. And um, the dialogue is, is clogged or taken up by uh, only one narrative. And we have to stop that because there are multiple narratives out there and there's no one narrative. Uh, of trans people. My hope is that in doing things like this, you know, in, in interviewing our elders and talking about our history, that hopefully, you know, not only will we be able to acknowledge the, the um, amazing and, and super important work that you all have done, but that we can build on it. So it just continues to improve and, and we're not needing to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Because we're, we're able to, to build rather than start over all the time. And your point is extremely well taken because that's what I feel like we just continue to start over. You know, we were, uh, you know, I sit in these meetings and we just start over every single time. You know, I feel like we were at this place 15 years ago and then before that and before that. And you're exactly right. And nobody seems to get that uh, uh, because if we could build, we would be so much farther along. 
Um, and now we're facing grave danger and people don't get that. And we're in fighting each other and not really fighting the people we need to be fighting. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Um, well, shifting gears, you've done a lot of interviews over the years. And by the way, I very much enjoyed getting to hear you on Terry Gross because I listen to Fresh Air every day and it was awesome to get to hear you on there. Thank you. But you, you've given lots of interviews over the years. Who is your favorite interviewer and why? Oh, God, I can't even tell you because honestly, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. And it's not because I'm vain. I just never listen to myself after I give an interview because I'm not that vain. I'm like, I do it. It's a cut and paste and I move on. Um, you're doing very good. Oh, by well, the thank way. you. I think you're a very good interviewer. <laughs> Seriously, I do. Um, I have given lots. I continue to give lots because I think it's important to be a voice. Uh, and that was my whole point in always being out. Um, you know, I came out in the Midwest and what I always want to remind people is Brandon Tina country because people forget the Brandon Tina story. And uh, I gave lots of interviews then. I was following and that was, and not that it's great then for trans people, but it definitely wasn't safe then, especially to be out in the Midwest where people drove around with, with guns in the back of their pickup trucks. And people literally walked across the street from me and didn't want to talk to me and shunned me. But um, and my own office would call me and tell me not to come to work because it wasn't safe. Um, and my own mother, because my father passed, would call me and say, oh, don't go in your office. It's not safe because. Uh, but, you know, I continue to persist because I, I figured that um, if I could be happy as me, it would be OK. And I knew that I would die young. That was the cost of doing this. Uh, and that was OK because I was going to be a truth teller. Uh, I am a truth teller. And that was most important to me that people uh, know who we are and that we are human like everyone else. And then it was so empowering when people that had been in their houses because they were trans for years on disability came out just to see me another human being it would just make me cry and um cry and uh, so that was important and i know that's not answering your question so um i don't really have one that's more important than any other i figured that if i'm out talking if i can just reach one individual and change them then that's that's uh key but i guess um Right, doing right wing radio uh, would probably be the best one. And I'm starting to remember that as I talk. Um, those are the best interviews. Yeah, well, tell me about them. Oh, because, uh, you know, it's more, um, uh, it's like playing chess. Uh, you know, they think you're going to say one thing and then you get the questions that come in and then you just are able to turn the people around. And you're able to make them human and see the human side of you because they will open it up for questions. And then people are just stunned at your answer because it's not the answer they expect. They're like, oh, well, you know, aren't you an abomination? And didn't God do this and that? And, you know, I'd say, oh, no, God made me. And then they just don't know what to do with the answers. You know, because they're just ready for somebody to fight with. And it's like, you know, I don't go there. You know, I'm, I'm going to quote our former lovely first lady, Michelle Obama. When they would go low, I'd just go high. And uh, so those were those probably are the funnest to me is doing right wing radio. So, <laughs> well, thank goodness you didn't die young because you've been able to do so much more truth telling about that many yeah. more years. <laughs> yeah. So, so those are the funnest. That's awesome. Now, in 2012, you became the first openly transgender person to testify before the U.S. Senate, doing so in support of the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. How were you selected to do this? Well, you know, good question. I had no idea. 
Uh, apparently, they've been trying to get a hold of me for weeks, and because I worked so many jobs, including my own law office, and was never sitting in a seat anywhere, they couldn't get a hold of me until the week before. And I owe it to Senator Tom Harkin, uh, who is now retired from Iowa, um, a great man, and to Senator uh, Merkley, uh, who apparently wanted me to testify. And so I actually was sitting at my desk in my law office, and my assistant answered the phone, and she said, it's Senator Harkin's office. And I'm like, yeah, uh, right. And, you know, I was like, yeah, right, you know. So then I pick up the phone, and it was like, this is Senator Harkin's office. And uh, I think I said, I said Merkley, but it's Harkin's office. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> what, yeah, how can I help you? And they're like, uh, we need you to testify next week uh, before the Senate. And I'm like, and they're like, we've been trying to get a hold of you for, like, weeks now. And I'm like okay and i'm like for what and they're like we would like you to testify on behalf of the employment non-discrimination act and they had decided somehow that you know i would be the right person because um you know i had been doing work on the hill for years uh on behalf of the non-employment non-discrimination act uh going there lobbying talking to senators and so forth, and they had decided that my story would be one of the most compelling stories. Uh, and then so I hung up and I thought, oh, Jesus, what, what am I going to do? And my biggest concern was, how do I tell a story, my story, but make it a universal story? And that was my fear. Because, again, it's not about me it wasn't about me, and that's the way I tend to think, and that's the way I think of my work. It's about us. And so that was my challenge. And so plus, you know, get all my other work done and then uh, in a week and, and figure out how to tell my story but make it a universal story. Um, and then the trauma that, that came up for me around telling the story. Because, um, you know, it, it was just hard um, to tell, you know, bring that trauma up and tell the story. Um, but it was, um, you know, it was scary, bring, you know, thinking about the trauma it was bringing up for myself. But I, I just grounded finally and thought about, you know, I have to tell the story. I have to get centered. And then I have to tell it from my perspective, but I have to tell it from a global perspective. So I sat down and, and wrote it out. And then, of course, I had a, several friends I vetted it through um, as well. And actually several organizations I you know, had look at it. But at the end, I, 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 I did my way. I, I don't want to sound like uh, uh, anybody else, but I did. I, I always have to tell it from my heart and um and that's what i did when i got there and uh it was scary um i, I won't deny that i was scared to death and people say well you don't look like it but i was and and i was glad and i won't name him but my dear dear friend went with me uh because i thought gee i'm going alone it's like wow and uh and uh he was there uh by my side and uh and uh, it felt good to do it. Um, it felt serendipitous because I'd always as a child felt that one day I would be testifying before the Senate. And lo and behold, that happened. I, had, I did. You know, I remember as a five year old kid pretending to be, you know, this lawyer and then thinking, oh, one day I'm going to testify before the Senate. And, and then lo and behold, it happened. That's so crazy. Uh, I did. Let five year olds think about that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, obviously I did because, you know, I didn't have much else to do, but be preoccupied about, uh, gee, I'm in the wrong, you know, I was like, the, people are calling me the wrong gender. What is wrong with these people? Because I used to think that, you know, as a five year old. And um, so I did, you know, and it was like, wow, this is like surreal and and also serendipitous that I'd had this thought as a kid and it's actually coming true. 
Uh, but I wanted them to feel the emotion and I wanted them to feel the realness of what it was like to be trans every day, all day, and everything that comes with that. Because it, it truly, unless you're locked in your house with your family, never leaves you because I've always been out. So it was always the trans person walking down the street and, you know, dealing with whatever attacks or whatever the things that people had to say and just having to have a thick skin about it and turning that around to be a positive and not letting that impact my mental health and realizing that those were the other people's issues, not really me. And it really wasn't about me, uh, but wanting them to understand that and then dealing with the bathroom issues and all of that. And actually, at that time, it was, um, I think the Senate was ready to hear that and even both sides of the aisle, which I'm glad. And I, I really hate that we're locked in this gridlock of just two parties because I think it hinders our process and we see that it does. But both sides of the aisle were open and attentive to hearing that. Um, since then, obviously, I think we've gone back and we, we focus on the wrong thing rather than we focus on human beings. We focus on, again, just as I started the story with the Negro and the white bathrooms, we focus on, again, the bathroom. And it's not about the bathroom. It's never about the bathroom. It's about we just want to separate people out because of our prejudices it's nothing to do with the bathroom. It's to do about human beings and accepting human beings for who they are. And uh, we all have to void. Um, that's not the issue. It's stop perpetuating hate and fear mongering based on your fears because it has nothing to do with being trans. Such a good point. Well, yeah. you, you talked about how you know, during your testimony that you really focused on the universal, what were some of the, the universal things that, that you really emphasized to help people be able to identify with your story? Well, that every day when you walk out of your house, it's like having to put on armor and prepare to go out and put up with whatever comes towards you as a trans person. And that's where the thick skin has to come in. And really, we all have to do our mental health work as trans people to prepare for that because it's really preparing for the world to transition with us. Um, but many of us take that on and never deal with that. And we live in this hate and the scarring and the damage gets to us. Um, and not that it doesn't get to me or it's tiring, but you really have to be strong in realizing that it's not about you, that person that hates you. It's about them and deflecting that hate because I put up with plenty of it because when I came out again, I was very out. I was very public and, you know, I walked down the street and people would cross the street from me and then I would just cross with them. They knew me and then I'd cross with them and then I would make sure to touch them or shake their hands. And I'm really I only learned to be a hugger in the LGBT community because that's what people do, because I was I'm not very. Uh, touchy at all. Uh, I, you know, it's just, you know, very, I'm very conservative in that way. But then I would make sure to touch them because they acted like, you know, like black would rub off. They acted like trans would rub off on them. And then I would make sure to do that. Or when I would go into the courtroom, because by that point I had to find some sort of employment and I don't like people touching me and, uh, you know, I don't have anything against sex work, but I knew that wouldn't be my bag because I don't like to be touched and I don't like to touch other people. So I'm like, hmm, that's not going to be work for me. I wouldn't make very much money doing that, that um, I had to figure something out. So I thought, well, I'm going to hang out my shingle. And I took plenty of hate for that with people not wanting to be my clients or working for me because I was trans. Uh, so, but I then had plenty of people that did want to work for me or be my clients. And because I just persisted, I was resilient. It's like, I'm going to do this. Nobody's going to stop me. You may have whatever you're going to say about me. That's your issue. 
your problem. And I continue to make that clear for myself and for them. And so those are the things I emphasize throughout my testimony and including the bathroom issue, you know, making it like, it's just an issue everybody has to deal with. And when I had to deal with it, you know, I was teaching part time at, at the university, which eventually took me in full time. Um, but, you know, it, it became I made it a non-issue. You know, my boss asked me where I was going and I'm like, he was going to the bathroom. I followed him right into the bathroom and went to the bathroom. And I think if we make these non-issues, which they really are then they become non-issues. It's only people inflate them as issues if we allow them to be inflated as issues because we're just doing the same thing as everybody else is doing. We're not creeps. We're not freaks. Movies have portrayed us as that, just like they have people of color. Um, and then we've gotten through those eras and those problems. Then we can get through this. Um, and sometimes I think we shoot ourselves in the foot by making them bigger problems than they are, uh, particularly the bathroom thing, you know, because many, many people didn't want me to say that to Congress, but I'm like, oh, we're not going to go around this issue. I'm going to go head on because that's the way I am. I'm a, I'm a bull by the horns kind of person. Um, it's like I'm a Midwesterner. Midwesterners are, we don't skirt around an issue. We, we talk about the issue. Right. You know, you heard me talk in Wisconsin and that's true. And that's why people love me in Wisconsin. It's because we, are direct. You know, we uh, don't hide an issue. We talk about an issue. And um, and so I talked about uh, having to put on armor every day, the bathroom issue, and then the lack of employment in our community and people wanting, uh, not wanting to employ us just because we're trans and somehow thinking that lessens our intelligence. When I went to work dressed the same way every single day and nothing had changed except I was going to legally change documents. And I have looked the same way all my life. Literally, uh, people will tell you that, uh, you know, uh, except I did have longer hair. I didn't have facial hair, but literally I have looked the same way. And then I dressed the same way and I'd already been wearing suits and ties. So what was different? And my work product is never. And because it did impact my self-esteem, I still have my work performance reviews still to this day. And I saved them because they were all stellar, excellent. So, um uh, and there was no attitude, but then people, when you treat them less than, begin to get attitudes and become impacted. But in my day, the employment rate, if it came out, you were immediately terminated. So it was like 99.9% .9 of us were unemployed if you came out as trans. And that has drastically changed, and that's good. And that's why I always remain visible and wanted to be visible to let people know that if I can do this, anybody can do this. Because I'm really just a human being that puts on his pants one leg at a time every single day and chooses to be resistant to people's crap and negativity about trans people. That's awesome. Now, two years after you testified before the Senate in 2014, you were one of the people standing by President Obama as he signed an executive order barring anti-LGBT workplace discrimination among federal contractors. What was it like getting to meet President Obama and witness such an historic event? Uh, it was awesome. I think had I already met him before that, because uh, uh, because he, uh, I think I'd already met him before that because of my testimony, but then I asked to come and be there because of my testimony again, uh, because he was very strategic. He wanted to get send a message to the Senate. Uh, that they needed to move the bill. And so he asked me to come and stand there. So that was an honor to be asked by the President of the United States uh, to be there. And that also uh, was, again, one of those things that I thought that one day I'll get to meet the President of the United States. And then again, it happened. And I didn't know how or why, but I did. And I must say that... Um, 
you know, I don't want to give the wrong tone to this, but it, it was nice to meet the first black president of the United States, yeah, given that as well, because, you know, my parents, and I, I was glad that my mother, before she passed, got to see that, because nor did I think I would see a person of color in the White House as the president in my lifetime. And then um, I had had relatives that worked and cleaned the White House uh, in my history. Yeah, according to one of my aunts, uh, who is no longer living. So um, so it was very... Um, uh, um, very awesome is uh, the words, and I know that doesn't capture it, but it certainly does. Um, uh, it it was oh, it was overwhelming. He was such a respectful, uh, thoughtful man, uh, intelligent, brilliant, and um, it was just awesome to stand by his side uh, because. Uh, he had the people's uh, will and thought and cared for um, all people and tried to protect the rights of all people. So to stand by him signing that executive order was a wonderful thing and protected hundreds of thousands of workers. So uh, I can't say any more. So oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Why have you devoted so much of your career to workplace equality for trans people? Uh, that's interesting because I never, that part I never thought I would do. Um, so the president, I, meeting the president though. <laughs> but right, right, right. And I've gotten to do some very neat things along the way um, that have touched my heart. And I think it was because uh, my parents taught me to work hard and that you could achieve whatever you would want to achieve, but then working hard for a corporation and then just having my job taken, even though my performance was stellar and I was told it was stellar, but just because it was could be taken away from me so easily just because I was trans uh, and they didn't understand what just blew my mind away. So, I immediately at that point went to work for workplace equality and got myself uh, on the Human Rights Commission in my city and served several terms for I don't know how many years uh, as a human rights commissioner in my city and just started to work on workplace equality. And because I feel like that if people have a right to work, then they can protect themselves in so many other ways. Um, and if that right is taken from you, then you're so vulnerable and you are sus subject to so many other things. Uh, and it makes you open to, uh, you know, God knows what. And so if you have the right to work, uh, then you can uh, do whatever you want to do. Uh, because I was in a very well-paid position and uh, on the rise, and it was just taken from me overnight. And I don't think that should happen to anyone uh, in, any, uh, in the circumstances that I was in, uh, just because you're trans. So... And so I still dedicate my life to doing that. I think that's important. And to me, it's not about uh, uh, being anything other than fighting for rights. And it was fighting for survival, um, uh, which I still do and will do probably for the rest of my life. That's because it's so important. It is. And I love, too, that it feels like this is kind of your parents' legacy, too, since they instilled in you, you know, that, that sense of, of hard work and how important it is to work hard. And, and now you've devoted your life to helping others to experience that. I think that's, that's just amazing. Well, I think you hit it on the head. It really is. Uh, that's why they are with me wherever I go, no matter when and where I talk, they are there. I talk about them because they did instill that in, in my sister and myself um, I rather, and uh, you're right, and and it is, and it's part of their legacy, which makes it so important to me uh, for them to be proud of me, even though 
Um, they are not on this earth, but each and every move I make, I think, uh, would they be proud? Is this what they want me to do? And uh, you're exactly right, my friend. That's so cool. Um, as a lawyer focusing much of your efforts on trans and LGBT law, where have we made progress as you see it? Well, we had made lots of progress. I think lots of activists had laid lots of groundwork. And through the Obama administration, we made lots of progress. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not sure where that lies now, honestly, uh, or what's going to happen because we are in a time of peril. Uh, I have to just be real with the current uh, president we have. Uh, you know, who's come out and said he's not going to sign an executive order. But, you know, my intel tells me different. And just watching him, you know, I think he says one thing one day and does something different the next day. I think that his reign of terror and his use of bigotry uh, to get into office, I think that LGBT people are going to be under attack. I think uh, we're going to lose many gains that we've won unless we can uh, use courts to continue our progress. Uh, we, we will lose many things that we won under the Obama administration, uh, sadly. Uh, I hate to be real, but yeah, I'm just being real. Uh, but we, you know, we had gained, uh, you know, so many things that I think that were wonderful. Uh, but I, I think we're going to have to fight hard. We're going to need the community, a community to come together and not be fighting amongst itself, but to pull together to fight for things. Uh, and I think what's happened is because it seemed so easy during the Obama administration, because he was forward thinking and understood trans people, um, that folks just took it sort of for granted. And now that climate has drastically changed. And so we really truly need folks to pull together and be working with folks that know advocacy uh, that are working for trans rights and come together and work in unity and not in discord um, to um, make sure we are protected. Uh, we, uh, you know, deportation is happening, uh, even though the order uh, was uh, banned by the courts, but you know, I just read six states, there are raids happening and more raids are going to be happening in satellite cities that have many people that uh, are immigrants. And that includes trans people uh, galore uh, that we're going to have people with mismatched identity documents. And that's going to be a problem yet again. And those are things that we used to fight and we're we're back uh, where we used to be. And uh, again, I hate, don't like to be a doomsayer. It would be great if we could have held where we were, but we don't have an administration that understands people really. We have an administration that is uh, on an agenda of its own. And so trans people really need to, uh, again, all I can say is bond together and, uh, and uh, realize that we may lose uh, our rights to travel. We may lose our rights to identity documents. We, we may lose our rights to access to health care uh, when we had all those things. And uh, we had uh, rights in various states and, and some protections, and we do with uh, employment that may hold on still. Uh, you know, uh, we had some uh, protections or patchworks of protections throughout the country that hopefully will still be there. But uh, we're in a land of uncertainty right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And are there more lawyers working on trans issues now than when you started? There are lots more. <laughs> and thank you. There are just lots you, more, right? <laughs> there were like five of us. Wow. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and we used to go, I remember doing creating change and 
other events and and we would just change rooms and be like what's the title of this workshop what's the title of this workshop and uh and uh and it was uh we did what we had to do so we could be out there talking about trans issues but it's nice to have lots of lawyers working on trans issues and I, again i think that there are nuances to trans law i think it's important for trans lawyers to be active in that process and uh, because we know about our issues better than anybody else but uh, it's nice to have a quad, uh, 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 I was going to say, I can't even say the word, but a, a lots of lawyers out there doing the work now. Um, and I'm glad they are because, you know, some of us are, are getting worn out and tired, but there were literally like five of us. And I remember the last greeting change in, uh, what is it, 2000 and. Uh, let's see, this is five where we were just like so tired of changing rooms and trying to remember what topic it was that it was just crazy. And uh, so things have definitely progressed in that area. And it's good, especially now, because uh, we have lots of litigators and we're going to need those to do this fight that we have coming up uh, with this administration. And that is a good thing. So. So I think people can feel safe with that, and I think people just need to check in and make sure where they're at. I'm not trying to spread panic or doom, but people just need to make sure that they know their rights, um, you know, and their rights being put out by immigration equality. So you make sure you know your rights there and other orgs so that you're protected um, and, you know, you don't have to answer the door. You don't have to do cer certain things just because people come knocking. And I think those are the important things for people to remember, not to panic. Uh, remember, you do have power. We all do have power and to retain that power uh, because this is just a re regime to terrorize us all. But, um, you know, uh, there are lots of lawyers out there to protect us. And, you know, I've gone back to uh, less organizing and totally to uh, the law to make sure that I'm definitely holding the bat um, so that we have protections. Yeah. Oh, thank God. Uh, last month you joined the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund. What brought you there? Uh, exactly what I said. I need to be holding the bat for this during this administration. I need to be in a place where I'm definitely lawyering uh, full-time and focusing on protecting trans rights. Um, they have transitioned to new leadership and I thought that was a good team to join and um, thought that um, it was a perfect fit and place for me to be at this time. And uh, again, I wanted to be holding the bat so that I can be litigating and making sure our rights are protected. Oh, that's so great. And what is your position there? Uh, I'm senior counsel. Great. And what, so, do you, what do you most hope to achieve while you're there? Uh, again, is making sure we don't lose ground, uh, that our rights stay in place, and that uh, we are as protected as possible. So if we have to litigate things, that we're litigating them. Because I see that, you know, whereas we used to rely on policy and working with the administration, we don't have that really anymore. So, you know, our, our, our protection is going to be in the courts. Wow. So before moving over to the, um, to the Legal Defense and Education Fund, you're doing work with a task force that was more policy driven, right? But then, yeah. touching, but then you caught wind of, of how things are changing and where you feel like you will be most beneficial. And so now you've moved over to, well, or moved back to law, right? Exactly. And yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. And that's what I've always done in the movement is I've looked at where am I going to be most beneficial um, in, in the movement and for the movement. And so that's where I've tried to be at. And now that's the call. It's like, this is where I'm going to be most useful. This is where I'm going to be most beneficial. And uh, so I, I think that I'm in the right place at the right time. I agree. And do you all at the at the uh, Legal Defense and Education Fund, do you also 
help litigators throughout the country too, or do y'all focus primarily on just um, handling specific cases yourselves? We handle specific cases ourselves. So um, other orgs will help uh, other litigators that I know, like, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, National Center for Lesbian Rights, I know, helps other litigators as well as litigate. Um, I'm not sure that what Lambda, but I know Lambda does lots of litigation. ACLU does um, as well. But um um, we don't really uh, help other, we work with other attorneys uh, because sometimes we need to expand our breath. So, you know, we will work with other attorneys that help us. Great. What do you feel is the greatest threat that trans people face today? Um, the new commander in chief. I would agree. <laughs> Yeah. And how do you see violence affecting our community today? It is horrific. I really, you know, that's one of the things I try to focus on before. I think that sadly, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm moving around. And if this, I'm trying to block out the big light and the little light here, I realize my hands and half the shot. So, um, I think it impacts our community greatly. I think that one of the things we don't do a lot of is self-care. We Most people continue to try to do advocacy or work and we don't do self-care and violence impacts us greatly. It impacts us from the outside, from the people that attack us uh, to internally where we attack each other because you know hurt people hurt other people. And um, then that keeps us from getting work done. And I always remember this pause because I've been in the, the greater LG or the gay movement for a long time, as well as the trans movement when uh, it was dysfunctional as well. But AIDS stopped that. And I remember everybody saying, we got to stop this bringing our own personal crap into the room and leave it outside the door. And I remember that pause, and I've had this discussion with so many people at that time and that era that remember that, and people made you leave your your stuff outside the door and come in the room to deal with the issues that needed to be dealt with. And somehow we have not found that click or whatever is needed in the trans community to do that, to where we still cannot come in the room to truly deal with the issues that impact the community without our personal um, stuff, for lack of better words, impacting and delaying us dealing with issues such as violence and uh, homelessness and, you know, unemployment and all those things, because I do think that there are lots of brilliant minds in the trans community, and we could have a well-built trans community if we could do those things, and lots of great leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, some days I wonder, you know, for those of us that argue to get rid of the rigid standards for the standards of care, you know, we work to get rid of those, but then I sit and pause and go, hmm, was that a good thing? Because that required people to go through therapy. And now people just don't do therapy because they think they don't need it when, when we all really do. And I think it impacts the community as a whole and it delays what we're doing. And that's what you and I talked about earlier about us then restarting the movement over and over again and never like really moving forward because I see us do it again and again and it's just different people, but we are do it again and again and again. And um, so I think that's again about self-care and realizing that we all have to take care of ourselves and that it's not about being... Uh, mentally ill or or any of that, but it's realizing that you're transitioning, society transitions with you, there are curves to transitioning, and it's difficult, and that sometimes we need tools that we don't have on our own, and that's what therapy is about, and so it's helpful to have that, 
and that sometimes we were hurt as children, as all people are, and that if we continue to carry that baggage around and never deal with it, it just builds up, and then we continue to hurt ourselves and we hurt others, and then that then delays the progress in the movement, and then we just hurt others, and that's what I see go on a lot. And so if we could find that great pause button that happened for the gay movement and the trans movement, I think we would be so successful. Uh, but we're going to need to find it. And maybe maybe the new commander in chief is that pause button uh, for us. And so I hope we find it. And I hope that, you know, um, we can uh, unite and come together some way. Yeah. Um. How did the Trans People of Color Coalition come about? Well, you know, it was a different time than it is now, but it grew out of a need of me traveling across the country and hearing trans people of color say they felt isolated. They felt that nobody was representing their them uh, as I traveled for other groups and other things that I was just doing. And, and that's how it came about. Um, and um, we're at a different juncture now where, um, you know, I, I think we'll be doing things a little bit differently uh, than we have in the past and be more of a, a sort of a think tank and producing things sort of that way because there are lots of groups out there and lots of organizations out there. But when it came about, it was the first and only uh, trans people of color group out there. Um, and so that's how it grew uh, or where it came from. Um, and I really didn't want to start a group, to be quite frank with you at all. Uh, because I was too busy and I did wait and wait for years for somebody to start a group and then nobody had started a group and I started it and then after that then like a plethora of groups emerged you know which is kind of ironic but um yeah so that's how it came about um I still think it's a good thing um I think you know our, our concept is unity um, it's not one or the other, it's all trans people, uh, united, um, because, uh, you know, it's not about divisiveness. It's not about taking or erasing anybody's voices either, but in unity, there's power. Agreed. When you were first starting to explore your gender, were you concerned about going from, being read as female to being seen as a black man in our culture? Um, that's interesting because no, because I always never felt as a female, you know, I just knew I was a boy from like the beginning of time. So I was very upset even as a child when pe I felt like people were misgendering me. And so it always amazes me when people say, how do children know? It's like, um, I can answer that. I did because I always knew who I was. Uh, but there was no science. There were, there were none of these things that people have now to explain it. Um, so I remember that. And then there were also only two places in the United States that you could go to get counseling or therapy or treatment when I came out too, uh, or were there two? There was the University of Minnesota and there may have been some places in San Francisco. And then I think that was it. Otherwise you had to go to Canada. And so I flew to, and I did this more for my mother because my father had passed at that point. Although I, I came out to him on, on my, on his deathbed, but he really like already knew, uh, because if you see the trans list, which I talk about, he was like my cover guy. Um, and so he like really got it and really always knew, um, and everybody like all, all, all already knew because I did this coming out to all my family. We were a large extended family and everybody's like, yeah, we knew this. So like, we thought you came to tell us something horrible. We love you. 
like knew this, but I had built this all up, you know, because people tried to put you in a box and I didn't know what box to check because I knew I really wasn't a lesbian. And, you know, so I'm like, uh, well, you know, so I never identified as anything for the longest time as I possibly could until people kept trying to force me into some kind of box, you know. And then so I chose I couldn't even say lesbian. So I chose the L. That's what I called it uh, for a minute because people kept trying to push me in a box and I couldn't even say lesbian. And I'd be like, the uh, 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 you know, and I didn't even say it because it's just like, this is ridiculous. This is not who I am. I don't know what I am, but I'm not a lesbian. Uh, and lesbians actually hated me because I was walking around going, yo, man, what's up? What's going on? Because that's how I was and that's what who my persona was at that time in my early 20s, you know. Um, so, um, so, but I did go to this one therapist that said that to me. And I said to him, well, you know, I think I have lots of experience from being black, and all that goes with it. So I don't think it'll be any worse being a black man. And um, because I used to get beat up every day for just being black anyway, or high yellow, if is what you want to call it, because the world was just black and white. And I never fit in because I was never dark enough. So and then my hair was real light. So I was used to being abused. So I was like, so what's the difference? And and it, it has been a social experience because little old ladies do hit the wall when I walk by, even when I would leave my law office in a suit going to court. And so my joke is that one day I'll just grab a purse just because society expects me to commit a crime. So, uh, you know, because it happens all the time, you know, and I get that reaction or I'm followed in stores and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, I think that's just being sadly, I hate to say black in America and black and brown in America. And so I don't regret it. I'm happy to be me. Uh, I think that just comes along with uh, who you, who I am. And um, it's it's what it is. Uh, you know, yeah, I don't wear my hoodie up, <laughs> definitely, even when it's cold, sadly. Uh, but I didn't do that before the Trayvon Martin shooting because I knew I was suspect of being shot, sadly. You know, and those are just things that you know as a black person not to do. And those are things I was trained not to do by my parents as a black person in America. And, uh, you know, it's sad, but it's true. So. You were featured in the seminal film, Still Black, which was released in 2008. It was the first film about black trans men and remains one of the only films to focus on black trans men. How do you think things have changed since the time when the film was made? I think it's, um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that. I think that, one, I want to give the, the creator of the film lots of credit. I think uh, he was very forward-thinking, Courtney, Courtney Ryan Ziegler. I think he's a genius, uh, and I want to give him lots of props for that. Um, I think it helped to show people that there were black trans men, number one, because I think people don't think, again, about there being trans masculine people, period, and then that there were black trans men and that were there different variations of us and we're not all the same. And so I think that he was a genius at doing that um, and that I think it helped to uh, give other young black trans masculine people role models because uh, I've heard that time and time again. And that was also why and is why I stay visible because I had no role model. I thought I was just crazy. And then I actually did think it was just uh, uh, not to be all about race because it, it isn't, but a white thing because I didn't see any people of color that transitioned, you know, in my day, it was just Christine Jurgensen, sorry, and uh, Renee Richardson. And uh, so I thought, well, I must be crazy because black people or brown people aren't doing this and there must be something wrong with me. So it helps, I think, to see role models 
that uh, look like you, that talk like you and walk like you. And so um, I'm glad to be other people's role models so they can feel like, okay, this is not, I'm not crazy, uh, that it's okay. So I, it's nice to be a validator for other people that they're, they can live their authentic life. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. How can we support the identity and lives of black trans men in a country that doesn't show much respect or dignity for black men in general? That's a very good question um, and a hard one to answer because uh, you hit it on the head. Uh, the country doesn't show much respect for black men at all. Um, you know, I used to be a criminal defense attorney and I could take you know, a client in with the same record that was not of color and they were going out with me and going home and I could take a black man in with one infraction and he was going to go to jail uh, with me and you hear my little Southern talk come out there. Um, and, um, but it, it, it was sad and you see it in the system and people that say they don't are just really blind uh that we have you know it's the new jim crow and you know that's uh, it really is you know we the proportionate to the population versus how many people are incarcerated as well as black women i want to throw that in and latina uh women and native people um i think one is respecting people regardless of their skin color um and not telling us wow you're articulate uh which is a hint, hint uh, for a black man, you know, I get that all the time. And it's just like, oh, yes. And I've gotten that since college. It's like, wow, you're very articulate. It's just like, well, what do you expect me to talk like? And um, or you're well coiffed or all of these comments that you would not give a white trans masculine person. Um and then recognizing that we do exist and that we are capable of thinking and giving us jobs that are up to speed uh, with our abilities. Because I have been underemployed in many positions and thought to be inferior, and I know it's based on my skin color. And I've been treated that way by other activists, and I've told them about it. And then, of course, then I become the angry black man. Um, and I, and I think that holds so true. And I, we can use the example of the commanders in chief. Uh, if president Obama had acted the way that, uh, this man is acting and, and I refuse to call him president, um, he would have been an angry black man. Uh, however, this man is acting erratic and unstable and he continues to be allowed to run the country. Impeachment hearings would have started immediately if President Obama had acted in any way. But we always have to jump higher, act a certain way to be allowed into spaces, and uh, as President Obama did, and be above everything to do our jobs, or we're judged inferior. And it's institutionalized. And it impacts even our LGBT organizations and people don't want to own that. Uh, but it does, because how can it not when we're in a society where it's institutionalized and structural? Um, so until we start owning those things and really doing the race work that needs to be done and we will never change. Uh, and people hate it because I call it out. Uh, and then it's like, oh, well, then you have a problem or you need to be taught how to be in an office. I grew up in corporate America where I have all the badges that show I know how to behave in an office setting. And I have all the awards for it in a box if you want to see them. So that's a slap and an insult for people, you know, because that you're taught well in corporate America how to behave. So in a court in an office setting, plus I've ran my own office. I'm a tenured professor. So for people to say those things to me is purely racialized. Um, so until we can own our own internalized racism, uh, even though we might think we're doing the work, 
because we are LGBT or because we're whatever, uh, I don't think things will ever change. And uh, I think this whole country has a lot of work to do. And sadly, but truly, this election has memorialized where we are in this country. And I've said it for years, and people always continue to say, oh, we're post-racial. And I was so glad, and honestly, I jumped up and down when President Obama said it in his exit speech, uh, because I've always said, show me where the post-racial world is, because then I will give you a million dollars, because there is no post-racial world. We are so racialized in this country uh, that we don't even realize how we treat people of color and denigrate them, even in spaces where we claim not to be. Do you think that black men are feeling erased in our community, given the recent amount of focus on the plight of trans women of color? Um, black men in general, or? Um, uh, black, uh, I would say, sorry, let me reread it here. Do, 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 do. Um, yeah, black trans men, sorry, are feeling erased. Um, uh, I think... Uh, I'm going to say yes to that, but I've had more conversations. I think trans masculine people in general feel erased in the movement. Uh, I've had many conversations with trans masculine people, you, not just black ma trans, trans masculine people, and all ma trans masculine people feel erased in this movement um, uh, and because of the dynamics and uh, are starting to organize around it. Uh, don't feel comfortable speaking in rooms, are attacked for speaking their truths, are not allowed to speak their truths. And I think it's really sad. And I think I spoke to that earlier a bit. Uh, so it's not uh, just black. I don't think particularly black trans masculine men and younger ones don't. The people that transitioned early because they didn't ever live in uh, the feminist world like I have or as women. So they don't un have an understanding like some of us do that we've lived a different life. And so then people want to erase the lives that we've lived and act like we're just men, men who, you know, are abusive and rapist and this and that and want to put all those things on us that are not true about all of us, there may be some people that do those things, perhaps, but uh, all of us are not misogynist and that we're being labeled that by by trans women when most of us are feminist and came up through the feminist movement uh, that are being labeled that. And, and we don't even have a space to tell our stories or share our stories or share our experiences. Um, so I don't think it's limited to trans men of color. I think it's trans masculine people in general. Uh, I've just heard from too many people um, that feel this way. So, uh, so I don't think it, uh, it's, it's most trans masculine people, honestly. And then, and they're over a certain age. And it, cause again, they're the ones that have lived uh, in uh, and have been considered female and then transitioned, you know, the younger ones, and I'm not trying to be ageist, but have never had that experience, don't really get it. So, uh, uh, you know, and there's some that do get it, because I don't want to say that. But for those of us that have lived the experience, our lives have been erased. And it's like, we've just been men. And we're just men, men. And we're just you know, doing what men do. And that's not true. Those are not our narratives and we're not able to tell them. So it's not just trans men of color. It's all of us uh, because uh, too many folks have called me and spoken with me and emailed me. And so there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of hurt um, uh, around this issue. Yeah. Well, what do you think that we can do to raise up both trans men and trans women simultaneously? Well, again, I think there needs to be this mindset of we are we are all trans people and that no one trauma is worse than the other, that everybody has suffered trauma and that actually trans masculine people have been supporting trans women in their trauma. So, like, how about turnabout is fair play? 
Um, and everybody should be supporting everybody in their trauma because we've all lived trauma. Uh, and so there should be space for all of us to share our trauma with each other. Um, and I know that there are older sisters that get that and allow that and are open to that. But then there just seems to be this whole new wave of, uh, oh, no, there's no space for that. There's only space for us and nobody else. And that is not what a movement should be about. So um, so the, there's a lot of there's a rise in suicide for trans masculine people because of this. And there's a lot of hurt because of this with trans masculine people. And um, I'm not sure what's going to happen uh, around this. But again, that's why I see so much divisiveness in the because there is no movement, uh, because this blockage, this there's this big blockage and that's the blockage. So, yeah. Now, you are a very successful person. Right, someone with a lot of drive, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of connections too. What would you say to people who are struggling, who may have experienced one hardship after another and may have a hard time hanging on to hope? It's hard. Um, I may look successful, but there are days that you know it's it's hard for me to get up to. It's hard for me to go to work. Uh, you're right. I've had a lot of drive. Um, you know, uh, recently, uh, for the la last uh, few years, I've lost uh, many core family members. I've faced some major health issues, and it's been hard on me. And uh, luckily, I've had some friends to depend on. I think you have to have a good network of friends uh, and family if you have them. Um, and then you have to keep hope alive. And I know that sounds corny, but it's true. Because if you don't have hope, you just don't have anything. And then I just keep pushing. And I do think resilience is the key. You have to realize that you are human, that your life is just as worthy as anyone else's life. And you have to keep pushing. Uh, you have to keep pushing that rock up the hill. Uh, as I said, people don't realize I worked five jobs until I was 50. You know, people just assumed I was just somebody with money sitting somewhere. It's like, no, I learned how to work at five and I continued to work and I just never gave up. And so when people said I couldn't do something like run my own law practice, I ran. That's just a challenge to me. You know, so I take when somebody tells me I can't do something, that's just a challenge uh, to me. It's like, OK, you say I can't. I'm going to do it. And I did it. And I had lots of straight people tell me that and spit in my face and do this and that and talk about me and whatever. And as my father would say, there's somebody talking about you every day of the week, all day long. And you know what I think about that? I really don't care because they're not paying my bills. And that's my father talking to. So you just keep on pushing and you keep on going and, uh, and, and make sure you have support while you're doing that. Yeah. If someone well, for starters, if you had a grave site and if someone visited it 100 years from now, what would they see on your headstone? Oh, God. I don't know. I actually do have a grave site thanks to my mother. Yeah? Really? Are you going to be buried next to your parents? Uh, yes, I do. Um, and, um, uh, you know, nothing special, uh, really. Um, you know, again, but... Uh, I would say that uh, he was a man that cared. He was a man that loved. Uh, and he was a man that worked hard uh, for his community. Yeah, and you have. And thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. We are all so lucky to have you in the world. Is there anything else you'd like to share with folks watching this? I'm honored that you wanted to interview me. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. You are a very nice guy and a very good interviewer, and I appreciate your time. Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I very much appreciate yours, too. We made it work. <laughs> we did. We did. And, and honestly, I cannot wait to meet you, and I look forward to meeting you and uh, sitting down and having a good chat. Yes, so. I would love that. Yeah. Uh, and good luck. Thank you.
Yeah, thank, thank you. you for everything you're doing. And take care and get some good sleep. Same to you, buddy. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.